How's it going, kids? So just FYI, the kids are staying in here today, so um, I do not expect it to be silent in here. I don't expect it to be even quiet. I expect a little bit of commotion. You know what? I'm okay with that. I'm always okay with babies crying. I'm always okay with that. You know why? Because it says that we have young families in this church, and that to me, I'm okay with that. That's totally cool. So my title for today is A Proper Response. A proper response. We're going to find out what that means here in a little bit. But kids, I want to ask you guys some questions, okay? Are you guys ready? And, and you can shout out the answer if you know it. I see I got a bunch of kids over here. So, okay, so we're looking for a proper response. If you're hungry, what should you do? Fantastic. Excellent. Listen, I agree, okay? I like to eat. So if you're hungry, a proper response would be to eat. Um, if you cut off a finger, I know we're getting a little dramatic here, what should you do? Call 911, go to the hospital, pray. <laughs> sure. Can't say I've ever done that. All right. <clears throat> Here's the big one, kids. If you find out that that cute boy or girl at school likes you, what should you do? I did ask for it. You're right. Okay, punch them is not exactly the answer I was looking for. Um, you would think it would be to go talk to them, but that's actually not the proper response. The proper response is boys are gross, girls have cooties. Ooh, right, parents? See, that was a nice way to rein the parents in on this, okay? All right, so that would be a proper response to that. Okay, now we'll, we'll, we'll shift gears a little bit here. I want to look for another proper response. Okay, here's the scenario. You have a holy God, okay, who requires perfection, holiness, and sinlessness to enter into heaven with him for eternity. That's the requirement. We got a problem, right? I won't ask for a raise of hands, but probably nobody in here is perfect, right? So here we have a little bit of tension. We do have a holy God who requires perfection. So we have a problem. But here's, here's the thing. That counts all of us out. But see, God loves us so much that he had to make a choice. He had to do something in order to make a way for us to be able to spend eternity with him. So what would the proper response be to this tension that we have? Holy God requiring holiness of us. We are not holy. What would the proper response be? I'll give you a hint. It's if you give this answer in church for most of the questions, you're going to be right. What's the answer? Jesus. Jesus is the proper response to the problem that we have, that we have a holy God who requires perfection. And so that automatically right there just cancels all of us out. But we have Jesus, God's own son, who crazy, like, I mean, it's a good thing I'm not God because, like, if I was faced with that choice or that opportunity or, or that, that conundrum, I would not choose to send my son down to live amongst people and to die the most miserable death. That's probably not how I would have chosen to do it. But for some reason that I can't even explain very well and we don't have enough time to get into it, that was what God required. Is Jesus laying down his life like a lamb at the slaughter for us and not just dying but three days later rising again like whoa why did he have to do that because he had to prove victory over sin death hell the grave you name it jesus proved victory over that 
And he gives us this opportunity. I'm just coming out of the gate swinging today, aren't I? He gives us this opportunity to say, hey, I I want that. I I know I've messed up. Just one little sin, if there is such thing as a little sin, cancels you out from heaven. And God gave us this amazing opportunity to spend eternity with him by, by accepting Jesus as your Savior. That just simply means, like, like less of me and more of you, Jesus, in my life. That's just like, you know what? You, you came and, and gave your life for me. I'm going to give my life for you. So that's a proper response that God gave to this issue. If, uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, that's where we're going to be today. Now, last week, we said that Jesus is the greatest gift in history. And kids, as you're in here, I know you're like, oh, I can't believe I have to be in here today. It's way more fun in the back. I know you guys had a happy birthday Jesus uh, party last week. But last week, actually, we talked about two things. We talked about Christmas trees and Santa Claus. You're like, really? Can you talk about those things in church? We did, and it actually worked. I was just as surprised as you guys. It worked. But last week we said Jesus is the greatest gift in history. But here's the thing. We kind of stopped right there. Not only is Jesus the greatest gift ever in history, but when Jesus came, he actually came bringing more gifts to us. Is like that even possible? Like, like. I think Jesus was enough, but not only that, not only Jesus for eternal life, Jesus came bringing gifts for us for this life that we're living here. And you're like, I've never heard this part of the Christmas story. I don't remember Jesus bringing like, you know, boxes and gifts and stuff like that. It's not exactly how it came, but Isaiah chapter 9, you may not know this passage when I say Isaiah chapter 9, but I can give you one little snippet of a verse and you go, oh, I know that passage. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. That's this passage right here. This is the prophet Isaiah, 600 or so years before Jesus came, speaking about, prophesying about this baby boy who would be born that would be the Savior of the world. So, real quick, I want to I I do this as fast as possible today. I know everybody's busy. we got a lot going on. We've got communion today. Uh, We've got services tonight, so real quick, five things that Jesus brings. You like that? I worked really hard on that. Actually, I didn't. I said it, and I was like, that rhymes, I'm sticking with that, so I can't take too much credit for it. Five things that Jesus brings. Number one, and this was basically last week's message, Jesus brings light to darkness, Question, is there some darkness in this world? There's some wicked, nasty, evil darkness in this world. And there's also darkness like just issues and problems and junk, and we're we're faced with it almost all the time. But Jesus brings light to darkness. Verse 2, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, realize it doesn't say that the darkness just goes away and never comes back. It says that light has come to shine in the darkness, to shine a big, fat spotlight on the darkness. See, that's what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't just come in and make all of our problems better. People expect that out of God, and and they don't see that, and they're like, well, God must not be real. That's not how he works. But Jesus comes into our lives into that darkness with us and shines a light onto it. Now, in this verse, there's two groups of people. There's people walking in darkness or sin. That's the first part of the verse there. It's just people that, you know what? I don't care if there's a God or not. It doesn't matter. I'm going to do what I want to do. We know a lot of those people, right? So like, like, just walk out these doors and there's a whole community of them. That's why we open these doors to reach those people. So we have people that are walking in darkness or sin. We also have the people living amongst those people. And that's us. That's we, we live in a world of darkness. 
But we're trying to, as followers of Jesus, to shine Jesus' light around. Write this down. No matter what your darkness, sin, or situation, like, like everybody has darkness in their lives. Sometimes the darkness is sin. Sometimes it's just a habit that you can't kick. It's a problem that you've had for a very long time. You've prayed and prayed and prayed about it. You have tried everything that you can do, which that's a little bit of the problem right there as we try what we can do to make it better. But no matter what, there's just this this junk in our lives. But that's the sin. No matter what your darkness, sin or situation, maybe there's a problem in your life. Maybe you've got relational problems. Maybe there's a diagnosis in your life. Maybe there's just something that has nothing to do with you. Like you didn't ask for it, you didn't cause it, and it's just there, you're living in it, and it's tough. I understand that. So no matter what your darkness, sin, or situation, the light of Jesus will always overcome it. When we, when we take that light of Jesus and we shine it in there and we follow Jesus with our lives, he will overcome the darkness. Jesus brings light to darkness. Now, with each of these five things that Jesus brings, I wrote out a very, very short prayer. Now, I'm not into praying repetitious prayers all the time just for sake of praying them, but I would just ask you to write these five prayers down, maybe take a picture of them and write them down, maybe make a card, just put it on your bathroom mirror, put it on your your dashboard of your car or something. And I truly believe, though, if we pray these things like we mean them, again, not just to pray them repetitiously, but pray them like... God, this is what I want in my life. I believe God will honor that. So here's our first prayer. God, bring light to the darkness in my life, sin or situation. Bring light to the darkness in my life, sin or situation. You can skip that slide right there. Skip the next slide. Next. There we go. And all the phones go up. God, bring light to the darkness in my life, sinner situation, whatever it is. When you invite God into those areas of your life, I'm not saying he steps in and just makes everything better right away. That's not how he works. But sometimes, sometimes he does. Oftentimes, he allows us to continue in that to work through that, to trust him more, to build our faith, to grow. And I love that he does that. I don't love it when it's happening, but I love that he tries to grow us through that. So God, bring light to the darkness in my life, sinner situation. Number two, Jesus brings joy through victory. Jesus brings joy through victory. Verse three, it says, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They, what? Rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. There's a lot of joy and rejoicing in that one verse, isn't there? When Jesus shines light into your darkness, when you allow him to do that, he brings joy into your life. Even, it's crazy. Have you ever seen somebody going through something just so difficult? Just like, whoa, I don't know how they're waking up and and going on throughout the day. And you look at them and they still have a smile on their face. You know those people, right? It's, It's crazy. It's like, how could they be happy? How could they find joy in a time like this? You want to know how? It's the answer to the question, Jesus. That's why when they are allowing Jesus to shine that light, they get victory over those things. And that that victory that brings joy, way better than any happiness, right? Because you can buy happiness. You can sin your way into happiness. Remember, if sin isn't making you happy for temporary, you're not doing it right. That's what sin does. It makes us happy for a very short time. And then guess what? You wake up the next day. 
you have all the problems that come along with that. But joy, joy is way better than temporary happiness, and only God can bring that through Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, it's a great passage. That's the passage of, you know, oh, sin, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? The Apostle Paul is almost mocking sin and death. He, he's just like, you've got nothing on me. Like, like, who do you think you are? Sin? Death? No way. I've got Christ in my life. And he goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He says that, oh, sin, where's your sting? Oh, death, where's your victory? 57 says, but, which is such a great word in Scripture, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through where? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the victory comes. And then the first part of 58 says, therefore, which means I told you all this, so here it is. Here's the bottom line. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. So good, church. Even in those storms, even when the darkness is there, we can stand firm. Why? Because we've got Jesus shining light into our darkness. And I, I, know, I know life, especially during the holidays, is, is stressful. It, it has been a stressful holiday season. Okay? In church world, it's, it's, there's a lot going on. It's a blast, but there's a lot. But I also know that sometimes the holidays are not so happy. Sometimes I know there's sadness. Sometimes I know there's depression. And there's hurt and there's pain. And I wanna be really, really sensitive to that. And I want us all to understand, hey, Jesus, again, wants to shine light into that. He wants to bring joy into our lives. There's a, a song that I love, it's by For King and Country. And the name of the song is just called Joy. And, and here's the lyrics of this. It says, Oh, hear my prayer tonight. I'm singing to the sky. Give me strength to raise my voice. Let me testify. Oh, hear my prayer tonight. Because this is do or die. The time has come to make a choice. So he, he's, he's facing this issue. It's like he's, he's crying. He's pouring out his heart to God. God, hear my prayer tonight. I'm like, I'm pouring out my heart, and, and this is do or die. Like, I have to make a choice. And the last line of the chorus says, and I choose joy. We can choose joy in our life. We can choose to keep our eyes focused on all the problems, all the negative, all the junk, all the darkness. Or we can keep our eyes focused on Christ, and that will bring joy. Jesus brings joy through victory. So here's our prayer for number two. God, bring joy to my life through victory over darkness. Short, sweet, simple prayer. God, bring joy to my life through victory over darkness darkness. Number three, here's another gift that Jesus brings. Jesus brings freedom to the oppressed. Verse four, it says, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now, you might be saying, what in the world is Isaiah talking about? Well, in Midian or the Midianites, if you remember that army, army that Gideon, not Midian, Gideon. Remember Gideon? Remember, what, what was Gideon known for? He was a chicken, right? One of my professors in college called him super chicken, okay? He was this, this coward that God raised up and said, no, no, I'm going to use, your, use you, mighty man of valor. At the time, he was hiding and God used him and 300 soldiers. He whittled it down from tens of thousands to 300 soldiers to defeat this army of Midian. So what Isaiah is doing is he's bringing this back to memory. Like, remember how God was so good that he just, he did a miracle. Like, you couldn't even believe 300 soldiers beat the whole army of the Midianites. 
And then it says, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. When captors would capture them, they would put this yoke on them. They would like tie a, a, a sticks or a branch or something to their arms, and they would walk them back to their land in slavery like this. And this verse says, you have shattered the yoke. Like, I have delivered you from, a, from slavery. I've delivered you from oppression. Whatever the junk is in their, your life there, I will deliver you from it. And Jesus is coming to break the imprisoning yoke off your shoulders. Rescue from oppression, whatever it is. I thought this was good. God breaks what is trying to break us. That's good. Whatever is trying to oppress you or to break you, God breaks those things when we allow him in our lives. Now, maybe you're saying this morning, see, Trev, I don't, I'm tracking with you here, but I don't really feel oppressed. I mean, I, I've got it pretty good. Like, I'm, I'm doing okay in life. I mean, you know, okay, Jesus isn't number one in my life like you're saying, but things are, you know, things are going okay. Like, I'm, I'm doing fine in my life, and I just, I want to warn you. Maybe if that's how you feel, you don't fully understand the position that sin has over your life. What you're not doing is recognizing how big of a deal sin is in our lives. And we've got to be so careful of that. We've got to be so mindful of the junk that we allow into our lives. And we think that we can, just a little bit's okay, and it's, no, no, I can handle whatever. God looks at that and says, why are you choosing that over choosing me? Why are you dabbling in the world and not focusing on me. Jesus brings freedom to the oppressed. So here's the prayer for number three. God, bring freedom from the oppression of sin and darkness to my life. Bring freedom from the oppression of sin and darkness to my life. Number four, the fourth gift that Jesus brings. Jesus brings heaven to us. Jesus brings heaven to us. And here's our verses. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The king of kings, God himself, came to us as a baby. That just blows me away. That that's actually what God would do for us because he loves us that much. With that baby came all authority, all power, all peace, all victory, and an everlasting kingdom that will never fade. That's what came that first Christmas with the baby Jesus. And to that I say, sign me up for that kind of king. That's the kind of king I want to follow. Not a worldly king, not, not a president or a government or a party or, or myself or none of that. That's what I want to follow because that sounds like it's going to last, well, for eternity, right? Jesus brings heaven to us. Here's our prayer. God, may your kingdom of heaven saturate my life. Just, just everything that I do in my life. Now, it doesn't mean that, that we have to just change everything in our lives, but that everything that we do, God, may you saturate my life. Number five, a little bit different of a gift here, but it is. God is excited to bring these gifts through Jesus. It's really interesting to think. Here's the second half of verse 7 is one of those verses that we would just read right over and not think anything about. Like, it sounds churchy, it's just supposed to be there, 
right? It says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You know what that means? It means that God wasn't forced into sending Jesus for us. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. He, he wasn't even reluctant about it. Like, oh, dang it, they messed up. I got to figure out something now. Ugh, these guys are a pain. Now, he probably thinks that about you. Just kidding. He thinks that about me. But he wasn't reluctant to send us Jesus. This verse actually says he was excited about sending Jesus to us. Again, th this blows my mind. Like, God, why would you do that? Here's, here's what one commentary says about this, this little verse right here. It's this Bible ref commentary. It says, all of this will be brought about by the enthusiasm of the Lord of hosts. In other words, God will accomplish this because he wants to do it. It is his plan and purpose, and he will bring it about by his power. It's crazy for me to think this little verse here, the second half of the verse even, sums up all of these gifts. Not only did Jesus come for us, for you and for me, but he brought all of these gifts along with him, this joy, this freedom, this shining light in the darkness of our lives, all of these things, he brought those things for us and he was excited to do it. That's a pretty good God, isn't it? God is excited to bring these gifts through Jesus. Here's our prayer for this one. God, bring the gifts you promised through Jesus in my life. God, all of those gifts, those things that we just talked about, bring those things that you promised in my life. I want to see those things. I want to live those things in and through my life. So five things that Jesus brings. Number one, Jesus brings light to darkness. Number two, Jesus brings joy through victory. Number three, Jesus brings freedom to the oppressed. Number four, Jesus brings heaven to us. And number five, God is excited to bring these gifts through Jesus. Now, that's God's proper response to us, even in our sinful state. Now, here's something that's really interesting. Here's, here's another thing that I, I just, I really can't comprehend. Because again, if I was God, I would do things so differently. It's a really, really good thing I'm not. We didn't have to clean up our act for Jesus to come. In fact, it was quite the opposite. We didn't have to stop that thing. It's like Jesus brings light to your darkness in your life when you clean up all your junk. Nope. Uh, Jesus brings joy to your life um, when you get right with him. N nope. He's offering those things. Look at Romans 5, 8. This has been my favorite verse ever since I was a kid before I could remember. I don't know what made me choose this verse as my favorite verse, my absolute favorite verse, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Now, pause just for a second. Like, okay, Jesus loves me, this I know. Right, the Bible tells me so. And it does. Okay, I, that's a great song. But it's not super helpful, is it? Because if you're trying to tell somebody who doesn't believe the Bible, hey, believe the Bible, God loves you, that's not really helpful, is it? But when we see something like Romans 5, 8, and it says, this is how God demonstrates his love. How do I know that God loves me? Right here. While we were still sinners. That right there might be one of the biggest phrases in all of scripture you didn't have to get your act cleaned up you didn't have to stop doing that thing although those things come a lot in time while we were still sinners christ died for us that's the best news and the best gift ever ever it's a good deal isn't it church I would say that's probably the deal of a lifetime, isn't it? It really is. So in response to all of that, Jesus, God sending his son, 
these gifts that he's brought us, we looked at the perfect response or the proper response of God to us. But that's not really what the message is about. I tricked you. You feel tricked? Here's the real, the real question. What should your proper response to God be? In light of everything that we've discussed today, God is holy, you are not, you cannot get into eternity, into heaven with him. You're in trouble, and boy, am I in trouble because I know me. I don't know you all that well. I know me, and it's not good, okay? It's kind of bleak, my outlook. But in response to that, Jesus came for us, gave his life for us so that we can give our lives to him and say, Jesus, I am not living my life for me anymore. I am living my life for you. So not only do we have Jesus, now we have these gifts or tools that we can have while we're living on this earth. Like when all of the junk and all the problems and all the pain and all of that happens in our lives, we've got some tools to use to get through this life. No way. So what should your proper response to God be in light of all of that? And as I was studying this week, I was thinking, man, there are so many verses that I could use, so many verses that I could think of that would be proper here. And, and I ended up coming back to the very first verse that I thought of, and that's Matthew 16, 24. Now, this is kind of a big verse. It's a little bit deep. It's like a, a, a gut punch, okay? But I wanted to be super clear what our response to be. Because remember, this life, you may have 80, 90, 100 years, but in comparison to eternity, it's nothing, is it? So when God asks us to do something or to live a specific way, in light of eternity, it's really not asking much, is it? So Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple, now pause there just for a second. What I don't want you to think is this word disciple means super Christian. It doesn't mean pastor. It doesn't mean missionary. It doesn't mean there's different levels of Christians. No, it just means a Christian. It just means a follower of Jesus, someone who calls themselves saved, I'm going to heaven. The, the, all of those are in the same category. So don't think disciple means something different. It just means Christian. So it says, then Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must three things, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now that's a pretty big ask. Now, that doesn't mean you need to drop everything that you're doing and go live in a monastery and just read ancient manuscripts all the time and just do that. That's not what that means. What this verse means, if I can just put it in just how we apply it to regular everyday life, it means that Jesus must saturate your life, everything in your life, and influence your decisions, your actions, your relationships, your conversations, your reactions to things. It means that Jesus must just saturate and inundate every area of your life so that when you are living your life and when you are doing you, people can see Jesus. That's what he's asking. He wants to be front and center in your life. And a lot of the times we're real good at putting him like stage left. Like, you know, he's over there or he's up on the shelf and we take him down when we need to or we think that, you know, oh, like, okay, I believe some stuff so, you know, I I'll spend eternity with him in heaven or, you know, oh, my, my grandma prayed for me so, so I'll make it there or, you know, my family, we're, we're this XYZ religion or denomination. No. That is nowhere in Scripture. 
But this means simply that Jesus needs to be the center of our lives. That's a proper response in light of everything that we have heard today. And there is, I mean, we scratched the surface, church, of the goodness of God today. Scratched the surface. And again, in light of all of that, I don't think it's too much to ask that we make Jesus front and center of our lives. Let's pray. God, thank you for the perfect gift of Jesus. Thank you that the debt that we owed with our sin was fully satisfied with Jesus. Thank you, God, that we can know for sure that we will spend eternity with you. And God, I know there are those here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who have not fully given their lives to you. Right now in this moment, God, would they make the choice to follow you, to make you front and center. God, I know there are some people here who just are broken. They're in the midst of it. God, help them to see you. Make your presence known in their lives. Right here, right now in this moment, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, that you've been relying on being a good person, you've been counting on the denomination or your upbringing and your family, you've been counting on something else for your salvation. Right now, I want to give you an opportunity to change that, to say, I want Jesus to be the center of my life. I see what Jesus has done for me the love that God has demonstrated for me. I want to give him my life. If that's you this moment, would you just say this simple prayer? You can say it to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. But Jesus, I make you the center of my life. I accept that you came to this earth to live and to die for me. And that you rose again three days later, proving victory over death and victory over sin and hell. God, in this moment, I give you my life. Save me, Lord. Change me. May your spirit saturate my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning, today's the day that you've decided to give your life to Jesus. I would love to know. I'm not gonna call you out, but would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today. I gave my life to Jesus. Thank you. Somebody else? Today is the day. Thank you. Jesus, I give you my life today. Father, thank you that you are so good, that we have a reason to celebrate Christmas, not just gifts, not just trees, but God, you are the true reason of the season, your son Jesus coming to this earth to live and to die and to live again for us. God, we just ask that you would bless this time of offering. God, help us to be generous, help us to be wise, and help us to further your kingdom in a way that more people will be ushered into eternity with you. God, help us to flood the gates of heaven. And we love you, Lord, and it is in the amazing name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.